All right, he is a Super Bowl champion, a two-time national champion, an all-big eight performer, and a former team captain here at the University of Nebraska, a free safety back in his day, Mr. Tony Velan. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate you having me on. How are you? I'm doing good. Now, I do have to mention real quick, Tony is joining us on the VIP line brought to you by Aloe Fiber, where we understand the importance of exceptional service service with local heart. Now, Tony, my man, normally you come to Josh Davis and I's youth football camp every year. This year, you know, Super Bowl champ, national champ, you big time. Where were you at, man? You didn't show up this year. What happened, dude? <laughs> I didn't big time you, man. I went out to um, to see my daughter. My daughter plays uh, professional soccer in high school. And so, although I love you guys, she's going to trump you guys every single time. Wow. Now that I know that information, I feel differently about things. I'm glad you chose your daughter over us. That is a very, very obvious wise choice. So I got, I got a whole bunch of questions for you, so I want to dive into it. I had Baron Miles on last week, okay? And Rob Zadiska, over the years, a former teammate of yours, has come out and said that he believes the 94 Huskers would have beaten the 95 Huskers. OK, because in his words, the 95 Huskers were the 94 Huskers backups. So when I asked Miles this question last week, he kind of agreed with Dr. Rob. What say you, Mr. Velan? who would have won 94 or 95 if we could play this fictitious game out in real life? Oh, wow. Why are y'all putting us like that's That's not cool, man. That is not cool at all. But, that's the whole um, point. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with I'm going with 95, man. I'm going with 95. I mean, you know, some of those younger guys had a little bit uh, more experience. You know, we had the swag of getting that first championship out of the way. So um, just because of the attitude and that confidence, um, I, I think we might have got them. Now, talk to me about where you believe the 95 team ranks all time. So on social media this morning, I responded to someone who came out. So Matt Leinhardt on Friday came out with his top five greatest teams of all time. And then he, quote, tweeted someone else who yeah. came out with their top ten greatest teams of all time and i know it's almost a pointless debate but it's also fun which is why i like engaging in it and 1995 nebraska was number six on this list okay and i can read you the list real quick and obviously i mean these are all phenomenal teams nobody's debating that but when you talk about the greatest of all time it's hard not to put nebraska from 95 at least in the top five so at number one they had 2019 lsu number two is 2004 usc Okay. After that, they had the 2001 Miami Hurricanes. Then fourth was Texas Longhorns from 2005. The 2022 Georgia Bulldogs, which I got to be honest, I chuckled at a little bit. And then the 95 Huskers. All right. So just having fun here and knowing that you're not completely unbiased, just like me, but we do the best that we can. Where would you put the 95 Huskers on that list? Oh, shit, man. I'm stupid. Shoot. Um... <laughs> Speak freely, dude. Dude, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going to put us probably one or two. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, just, that's just how I feel. That, 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 is, that is just how I feel. There's some great teams on there. Um, I know they got the uh, 2001 Hurricanes on there, which NFL talent, unreal. Uh, 2019 LSU, yeah, I get it. Um, but I think when you talk about probably the most dominant from a game-by-game -game standpoint, I think that was us by far. So – I have quite the lengthy response to this. I really addressed the top six teams. I didn't want to address because he put out his top 10. I didn't want to address the top 10 because that would have been a whole novel. So I kind of go through and I talk about each team just a little bit. All right. Now, the, the, the 2022 Georgia thing kind of makes me chuckle because they barely beat Missouri by four. They beat a Ohio State team who was embarrassed at home by Michigan by one point. So I said top 15 and not, not top five. Okay, you go to 04 USC, probably Chuck Carroll's. Uh, Pete Carroll's, I'm sorry, best all-around team, but I don't know that they beat the 05 USC Trojans. The 05 USC Trojans just ran into 05 Texas. Now you go to 2019 LSU. I'll tell you what. When you beat seven top 10 teams and you beat three top five teams and you got one of the greatest of all time in Joe Burrow, that, that, to me the debate is 95 Huskers, 2019 LSU, and I'm sure you know some of this stuff about the 95 Huskers. Okay, and I also was took exception to the fact that the 71 Huskers were left off this because they beat number two, three, and four in the country by an average of 20 points all those years right. ago. But the 95 Huskers, you guys, okay, I'm talking to someone who knows this better than me, beat four top 10 teams by an average margin of victory of 31 points. 
That is crazy. I've got more stats here, but just let it lie there. What What are your thoughts on that, Tony? I'm just saying, say it again for the Logan and Chiefs. They need to hear that. All right, man. <laughs> just saying, like, I, I can't, I can't, I can't debate LSU like that. That 2019 LSU, they they did some of the same stuff, but we trounced the top teams. Like, yes, was that better than all those teams? So, in my opinion, that that puts us up there. I mean, everyone wants to talk about 0-1 Miami and all the draft picks. I'm going to point to the fact that they beat a four-loss Vatech team by two points. I watched them struggle versus a four-loss BC team, and it took a late interception to seal it. So I'm going to go by results, not just by talent. I mean, you guys had 27 draft picks on your 95 team as it was. You only trailed for 12 minutes all year, didn't give up a sack the whole year, beat number two Florida 62-24. All right, we, we, we've ended that debate for eternity, Tony. 95 is the greatest of all time. All right, you ready for the next question? I appreciate it, brother. I appreciate it. Because <laughs> my next question actually is about Florida. That's that Fiesta Bowl. Because going in, you guys were number one. They were number yeah. two. But you guys were actually the underdogs. And everyone was talking right. about Nebraska was too slow. Florida was too fast. The old fun and gun. The whole thing about grass versus turf. I'm sure you remember that. Because they had played a bunch of games on turf. Nebraska hadn't. That was some sort of huge advantage. And then you guys go in and you whoop the rear end sideways like you did. How were you able to really not just contain, but borderline dominate until the end of the game. A, a Danny Werfel, future Heisman, Steve Spurrier, fun and good, spread out, led high-scoring offense the way that you guys did. Um, I, honestly, I, just, I think it just came out of toughness, man. I, I think they weren't used to playing so much my football. I think they weren't used to the line and the pressure that we were able to put on people. Um, I think our secondary was um, undervalued. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we put pressure on the whole, the whole game, you know, and so when you're, you're going back and forth and from a defensive standpoint, they couldn't stop our offense from a, from an offensive standpoint, we knew what to expect. We had played teams like that early in the year. So we were, we were prepared for it. And so we just, you know, we, 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 we played the game plan that, that coach Osborne came up with and honestly, it, it wasn't close. And I'll be honest with you, they, they played us closer the first quarter and a half because they, they were running a little bit. And then when they abandoned the run, it was just like, okay, you know, let the dogs loose, and, and it was over from there. I'd have to go back to double check. I think it was like ten nothing at the end of the first half, but then I think at halftime, I I, I may not be exact on this. It was like thirty five ten or something like that. Like you guys really just yeah. ran away with it. Here's a question I've always wanted to ask, and I don't know why I haven't asked somebody this question before. So here's how I wrote it down: How much respect did you all have for Brooke Berenger in nineteen ninety five? while he quietly sat and watched from the bench, okay, as Tommy Frazier, okay, basically had what should have been a Heisman season in 1995. How much respect did you as his teammates have for him during that year, knowing he could make plays in his own right? Um, I think everybody had the utmost respect for Brooks, man. When it came down to it, that that was was the epitome of a player of Nebraska, right? You know, you come in and you you put the program first, you know, you – you could have, you know, made a stink and become a cancer and be like, hey, I had a great year last year. I should be, you know, playing right now. But he didn't do that because he was all about the team. And and that's what that team was about. It was about sacrifice. It was about doing the things that was going to, you know, when it's all said and done, allow us to capture that championship, capture that goal. And that's what Brooke was all about. I was, I was, you know, so glad to be able to come in with him. I was so glad to be such a, you know, a good for him to be a friend of mine. And, and so that's why he has that statue, you know, in front of the stadium because of the type of person that he was. All right, I'm joined currently by Tony Velan on the Aloe Fiber VIP line. All right, Tony, 335 defense. I don't know if you ever played in it, but where do you, because you were free safety. All right, where do you think you would have played in the 335 defense? And what are your thoughts on this new defense the Huskers will be running this year? Man, I, I, I've i never played in the 335, and I, I can't say that I'm super well versed in it. I don't think I would have played much of a different role than I did. Originally, where I'm, you know, the deep middle, deep safety, you know, something along those lines. Um, I, I like the fact that it, that it provides a lot of flexibility, um, allows us to put more athletes on the, on the field to be able to make plays. Um, I, I want to say I'm confident going into the Big Ten, but, you know, you know, Big Ten plays some smash mouth football. So if we've got those smaller bodies in there, I'm just hoping they can fly around, similar to kind of what we did. Still, you know, making plays, getting around blocks and, and, and stuff in the run. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm – you know, I'm, I'm going to believe in, in what they're doing. Um, I went down to the, to the spring game, and while well, I didn't see anything that was, was 
Also, somebody didn't see anything bad either, so I think that's something to build on considering that they just started that. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that we can we can make some plays. Man, you know, defense wins championships, so that's that's the, the biggest thing that I'm you know anticipating right now is for our defense to come out and do some things. Yeah, no doubt about that. And if you listen to what Rule had to say about the scrimmage the Huskers had this past weekend, he said the defense kind of dominated, which gets me excited about the defense, but concerned about the offense because you know you don't want it to be lopsided. But uh, here's another question. I've always wanted to ask someone who played with John Elway because you won a Super Bowl with the Broncos with Elway as the quarterback. And here's why I've always wanted to ask somebody. So when I was in D.C., Shanahan was the coach, and I heard rumors. Obviously, John was, I assume, the big dog on the team when he was in Denver. Obviously, he had Shannon Sharp, Davis, the running back, Terrell, all those guys, other guys as well, Steve Atwater, but yourself. But I heard rumors that if Elway came in on like a Wednesday, And he went into Shanahan's office. He's like, Coach, I'm just not feeling it today. All of a sudden, a padded practice might turn into a walkthrough. And obviously, John was so tenured at this point. It wasn't that he was lazy because nobody's ever going to question that about him. He just had that kind of pull on the team. But I got to ask you, is there any truth to anything like that in these rumors and innuendos that I've heard over the years? Well, I mean, I'll say it like this. I mean, yeah, he's, he was a big dog. Um, when he didn't feel like doing something, he didn't do it. But that wasn't a situation where, you know, that happened often. You know what I mean? You know, he he had earned his strikes. Um, you know, he knew what rest he needed to take and, and what time he could take off and still be effective during the week. And, yeah, there might have been a few times where I think we expected him to, you know, to be out there and, and you know, his body wasn't didn't hold up that, that particular week. But it never showed in the game. And so, you know, it was all said and done. You know, you know how it is. You know, mm-hmm. Time play for some perks, and you know John got his perks, so I can't complain because he got me a ring. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so to good, be, uh, yeah, and just so folks understand, to be clear, nobody's ever going to question his work ethic. You got to keep in mind at this time, uh, right. at this point in time, John had played in four, three or four Super Bowls, won a Super Bowl. He was 37, 38 years old, trying to get that second ring. I played with a guy in D.C. named London Fletcher. Okay, he doesn't talk as much as Ray yeah. Lewis, but if you compare the stats, he's just as good, if not better. My last year there, he walked right. around, and he, he had some foot issues going on. He walked around all week, every week in a boot. He'd go through walkthrough, wouldn't do practice, and then he'd go out in the games, get 12, 15 tackles, and made the Pro Bowl again. So it's, it's different right. when you've been in the league for like 15 years right. plus. So when, nobody's questioning anybody's work ethic or anything like that. Let's be clear about that. All right, last question. And this is a plug to – uh, a former black shirt buddy of ours, a former Husker, great national champ, just like you. Uh, Cause I, I have seen on, at least on Twitter, you've done, done some, uh, some stuff with Steve Warren in the Warren Academy. Okay. So oh. talk to me about some of the things that Steve is doing, some of the things you've done with him and how this has benefited some of the, the youth and high school football players in Nebraska, Omaha area. Well, me and Steve started coaching together. What I want to say was back in, I don't know, oh four or so five this he, he he coached one year with the beef and I was a defensive coordinator at that particular time. But I also coached with him at Cordia High School, I coached with him at Northwest High School, um, you know, helped him with his dream foundation and also with Warren Academy. I think when it kinda of comes down to, you know, we've always had just a heart for the kids, you know, heart for athletics and, you know, trying to figure out a way to create more opportunities for the kids within within our community. And so when he came up with Warren Academy it was just about, you know, we've been to the you know, to the mountains mountain peak as far as football now it's time for us to be able to, to you know give back to the kids and, and hopefully allow them to get opportunities either scholarships or make it to the next level and so and so we've been doing that for i want to say like 10 11 12 years um and it's just been amazing because you know we've, we've got a lot of kids opportunities that they probably wouldn't have had in the past um there are a number of kids that are on the team right now that have had something to do with our program whether they were you know, doing our, our training or they're doing seven on seven, you know, they, they're getting some of our teachings and, it, and it's kind of paying off. And, you know, when it comes down to it, we just want our, we want our kids to have the best time success that we probably can. Um, and so I've, I've been um, honored to work with him for a number of years. I don't see that stopping anytime soon. And I'm just grateful for the man that he is and grateful for the, uh, the effect that we're probably that we're having now. Well, shout out to you guys. I want to show you guys a little bit of love. If you get a chance, if you're an aspiring tackle football player, check out the Warren Academy, also the Dream Foundation. They're doing a lot of great things with that. So I want to thank you and uh, Steve Warren for what you guys are doing. And I want to thank you for your time today, my friend. Of course, man. Of course.